Pain teaches you more than pleasure. Failure will teach you more than success. My youngest son ran away. He left a suicide note. He borrowed some money and got to Miami in the hope to buy a gun so he could shoot himself. And I was determined not to lose this child. And at the age of 21, I escaped back to my parents, only to be met with furious fists as I had dishonored my father and family. But what, what were your thoughts? What was going through your mind? I mean, I just didn't want to be, I just didn't want to be anymore. You know, I, I remember laying in almost a bath of my own blood. I want you to think about that. A lot of us always make excuses. Why we can't do this, why we can't do that, why we ain't dealt the best cards. Well, today's guest will definitely inspire you. She does TED Talks. She mentors MMA and UFC fighters. And she's also a best-selling author. I want to welcome to you, Nina Olik. Hi. Did I pronounce that right? You pronounce it the Indian way. I just say Olk, yeah. <laughs> Olk. Okay, okay, okay. It is what it is. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, do you know what? i got to say you're really humble and thank you so much for replying back because I know you get thousands of messages on your Instagram but you showed a lot of love and, you know, coming today. Like, I really appreciate that. I just saw you as a little brother. And um, I don't often get asked by people from my own culture because I'm stigmatised. They're a little bit worried often what I'm going to say. So I completely respected the fact you reached out. Um, and we've been communicating, so I'm more than happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, well, do you know what? I, I don't know what culture, skin, colour, where I'm from. I'm the first thing, well, our religion sort of teaches us is to be human. Yeah, that's know? what Guru Nanak said, actually. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we've got to be human. And, you know, cultures and traditions have swayed it all into different, you know, ways and paths, you know. And I think maybe this will be something that's quite refreshing right now. Mm. Maybe we should realign the basics and saying this is what we are about. This is what we do bring to the table. These are the role models you should be in the room with, you know. Normally when I'm near a Punjabi man, he wants to punch me in the face. It's quite refreshing to be here and not have that from you. That's terrible. That's, that's it is terrible to hear, <laughs> you know. Like, why would somebody want to do that? You know, you're actually helping the community. Like, how many of us can say that? Mm. You know, just before you came today, you were telling me a story. You are solving a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I had a young lady who's um, homeless, um, running away from an honour killing. And unfortunately, the police don't take it seriously. They don't seem to understand because it's a cultural thing, you know, with their um, idealisms of what culture is. And often I'll go into Scotland Yard and back there tomorrow. I was in Leicestershire headquarters talking on Friday. Wow. And I just feel I'm ticking a box, but they're not actually listening. And out of 40 delegates... Around 40 delegates, one came forward at the end to say, um, you know, can you tell me what more I can do? There seems to be a lack of compassion, especially within the services, and they are here to serve and protect. And I'm paying their wages as far as I am concerned, but they're not really delivering what they should be. Do you think our voices can be heard? I believe people have the power. I believe it needs to be taken away from the services that... If we stand together, you and I stand together, we become louder. If we have another third person, if you get your little boys in with us, you know, we'll all be so much louder because we're singing from the same hymn sheet. And I think the unity has gone from a society. We don't know how to love one another. It's all very fake and filtered. We can't even communicate because we're so used to texting as opposed to calling. Face to face, people find it difficult. They feel uncomfortable because they don't even know who they're talking to. Somebody looks totally different to they do when they appear in person because they've used this fake and filtered profile, you know, just to make themselves feel better. So it's a sad affair, but I'm doing as much as I can to inject as much love into the world. I can imagine, like, I, I totally agree with you, actually. You know, um, even when somebody's been aggressive on an email, when you see them face to face, they're this shy little timid person. They're very, like, keyboard warriors. Definitely. I also think that COVID's affected a lot of people because... Um, in the education system, every single year has actually essentially lost a full year of education and interaction. Mm. There's certain kids who don't even know how to queue up because they lost that important year from year three to year four when they're taught in the dinner hall to queue up properly. And 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 I don't know if you noticed this, but some people, a lot, a lot of people find it hard to make eye contact and yeah. even look at you and hold up a conversation. Yeah, I do. Yeah. What can we do? 
about you know helping and supporting the younger ones because it is up to us to change mm. this you know what what can we create is there things that we can do or help keep them busy any activities well parenting's hard and the thing we teach our children they take with them for a whole lifetime it's not just a short period um i think teaching children people skills how to manage money the importance mm. of money because a lot of parents are always using negative words like we haven't got we've have not got enough money for that we can't afford it yeah. and that builds this thing inside the child to be super stingy when they get older and i've seen it myself so are if they you can, negative thoughts is that what you're saying well we, we have to be super careful with our words around children we, mm. we've got to start using words like we haven't got the money yet, yet. Or what can I do? Let's see what we can do to resolve the problem, which then gives that child that gift going forward that every time they have a problem, they'll think, what can I do to make this problem resolvable? Um, one of my clients is a UFC um, coach for Conor McGregor, Owen Roddy. He's an amazing man. And he said, I wasn't getting enough time with my children and I don't know what when I can do affirmations. So we created a solution. So now he drives the children to school. He's got three beautiful girls. He says affirmations every morning. Every morning is a habit now. Those three girls will take that on to their children. But the best thing is the youngest thinks she's a money magnet because that's one of the affirmations. I am a money magnet. Money comes to me easily. And she's constantly finding pennies around everywhere and saying, Dad, Dad, look, I found this. And I just think it's a beautiful gift to be able to give to your children. It's almost like you're saying change their focus. You know, money, money is abundant. It can be everywhere. It's in your pocket, in his pocket, my pocket. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just how do you get access to that? It's just a formula. It's not you can never have access to it. And you're right. Some of us are conditioned to say, you know, money's evil, money's bad, and it causes problems and uh, more issues when it doesn't need to be that way. I mean, I was taught money from a very young age, and you can see the results of that. I'm really, honestly, nothing special at all made it to a, a status that people say you're in that millionaire circle but there's nothing special when you speak to me you think he's just a normal guy but it's just how I see money do you know what I mean and these are the results that you can sort of get from it um so yeah Nina um we talk a little bit about property and finance and them things you told me you dabble in a little bit of property is that yeah, right? yeah so I um originally I didn't um when I met my children's father he was renting a place in a place called Leicester and we moved into a nicer place called Market Harbour which is when I met him um, and to cut a long story short I wanted to make my dad proud so maybe it wasn't the right reasons I was doing it I was wanting to prove to him that I'm just as good as a boy my father has a huge portfolio of houses he owns over two to three hundred houses wow. and um, growing up regardless of the negative things in my life I was the one who would often help with bookkeeping ordering beer and things from the brewery from a really young age because I spoke well. Um, even though I didn't have the interaction with them, I was still learning. You still absorb what you're around. And my father was a very acute businessman um, to get to where he's got to today. Um, although his morals I don't agree with and I'm not condoning his behavior. But he, um, I wanted to be that boy that he'd be proud of because obviously he didn't like me because I was a girl. So when I moved and had my daughter, my instinctive thing was to provide for her. Mm -hmm. And I went from, you know, having nothing to having a mobile phone business to renting a property. And then I wanted to buy that property because my father always said, you should never rent. And I was really good at negotiating. I negotiated that property for 8000 at the time. 8000 8000 It was Where It's a was small that? shop. It's a small shop in Leicestershire. I mean, it's worth probably over 300000 now, but I haven't got it, unfortunately. <sighs> but... um. <laughs> And then I bought a house because I saw the, you know, I could see a, a vision of a house that was on the corner, obviously, with a lot of land behind it, land on the side. So it was a really beautiful plot overlooking fields. And I had this vision of duplicating the house, which I did. And I turned it into an eight bedroom house um, with a double garage. It was it's really nice. Um, and again, I saw a property next to me. I had this vision that I'd own the whole street at one point. And it's nothing wrong with aiming high. Um, and I asked the post office who was selling that property, can I rent your property with an agreement in the lease that I can buy it for the same price you're asking for it now? Because I knew that would give me time to get that money together. And I bought that property for 250000 and now it's worth, now that I've put some building um, applications just gone through, it'll be worth um, just one point two for the building that I've put through and the bottom part's probably worth about 800 So, wow. So you got an option lease agreement. 
yeah. felt like it. Which didn't exist. It didn't <laughs> exist, but I created it with the agent, yeah. Wow. Do you know these are actually strategies used by some of the top property gurus right now that they show you how to do these things and you didn't, you I didn't, didn't know. You didn't even know what you were doing. Didn't apart know what from, I was doing. I want to buy it later. I'll sort your payments out right now. Yeah. And later on, when I, I fall in money. love with buildings. I love architecture and I love okay. old buildings. And it was a real prominent building in the town central market harbor which is like one of the best places to live according to google <laughs> you know it's literally an hour away from london the property is a walking distance from the station you know i had it all in my head from 30 40 years ago in my head what i was going to do so yeah it was just a really beautiful building and i i just wanted it so much that i was willing it to happen not knowing how i would but i, I always have this theory that if you want something really bad you'll find a way you'll find a solution and I did. I, I managed to get, I remortgaged my home. Um, I got an additional loan from the bank and I got credit cards and I made it happen. Made it happen. You played about I bought it for 150 debt. that building. <laughs> Brilliant. So you mentioned just a, a minute ago that you set up a mobile phone shop. I did originally. How that was my you, first business. How did you do that? Well, I was um, renting from um, an Indian family who had a, a news agent, maybe like your dad possibly had. And I was always bored. So I'd take my little girl. She was a baby down there and they used to fuss over her a lot. And I remember going down there one day and this chap walked in and he was talking about easy money. And my ears just propped up, you know. <laughs> I was this almost single mother, I have to say, supporting my child. And I followed him to his car and I said to him, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, sorry to interrupt. You know, standing there with his big Mercedes with his brogues on and his dark denim jeans and his check shirt. You know, I remember it really clearly. Yeah. And I said to him, could I just ask you about what you were talking about? And he said, oh, I sell mobile phones, but you won't understand. And he, he said, not, not to worry, dear. It sort of submits to me. But normally when people say no to me, it makes me want to try it harder because that's all I've had from birth. Mm. So I let him go. I decided I was going to go down to the phone box. And I, this is after a few hours. It had got dark. I wrapped my daughter up in a push chair, ran down to, you know, the phone box, had to prise the door open with a buggy, rang 192, because in those days we didn't really have access to Google and things, and um, got the details, because I know he was from Kettering, because I heard him in conversation saying to the lady, so which is the best way to Kettering? So I assumed he was from Kettering. Kettering's a small place. <coughs> Um, and I got the details and I wrote him a contract because obviously we didn't have computers or printers. You know, I'm going back to the nine, early 90s. And I wrote him a contract saying that if you agree to do business with me, I guarantee I will sell this many units every month. And I did so well that he did really well, but also Orange came straight to me, who are EE now, saying we would like to sponsor you to have a shop for us and sell for us directly. We'll send you on training. You know, you can have staff, we'll help train the staff. And it just went on from there. But then the mobile phone industry was becoming saturated. So I yeah. was looking at what else do people need. And when they would come in, I had this habit of just people person, you know. So what are you looking for? Printers, computers are coming in now. I also placed my daughter into a more expensive nursery I could barely afford. And every time the bill was coming through, I'd always be, oh gosh, the bill's about to come. I need to keep that money aside. But that's where all the doctors went, the nurses went, all the professionals from the local town. Um, so I would go to pick her up at the time they would go to pick up their children. And it was that networking thing. I gauged that from an early age that mm. It's knowing the right people, yeah. making yourself known to them. And I had a coffee machine that I'd bought from, I think, eBay at the time. And I would say to them, come over and have a coffee at my shop if you're ever around in the town centre. And they did. And when they would sit down and they were relaxed, um, they would buy whatever I was selling them because they bought into me as a person. And I think that's key, you know, being an authentic, genuine person. People keep coming back to you. So they needed LED screens because obviously plasmas had just started. They were quite expensive, but they could afford these things. And I would, you know, always listen to people. That's another skill a lot of people don't have is listening yes. to what somebody really wants instead of telling them what they need. <clears throat> and I would just find them the solutions to their needs, really. It's phenomenal in that one little paragraph what you've just explained to me. You've explained so many things that, you know, we teach in mentorship, do you know what I mean, is they say your network is your net worth. And you saw that just getting your child in a certain environment also got you into an environment, you know, so there's more opportunities. And um, yeah, how people will buy into you. So by you showcasing your personality, people are looking, yeah, I really like Nina. 
you don't have to be the cheapest around. People just got to know they like you, they like your service, and now they can come to you, right? Yeah, no, totally. And, I, and you know, I, I was a person of my word. I always had that integrity, which a lot of people didn't have in my town or still don't have. Um, I was integral. So if I said I would do something, I've always done it. And, you know, people that know me now will vouch for that. 100. And it's just amazing because another thing what my father always says to me, he says, Sean, like, do you know, a lot of parents do tell their children, but not everybody chooses to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important skill what you just mentioned that you listened you know? I think a lot of parents don't listen to their children, if I'm being honest. You know, I've made that mistake myself. I haven't often said to my children, how are you? Because as parents, it's difficult. You know, we're trying to provide all the time. Yes. So sometimes we get dissuaded or we're checking a phone or we're looking over the shoulder at whatever someone's doing in the background, not really focused on that person. Mm. And I think one of the things going forward for children is for them to feel heard, but also to be seen. Yes. Yes, yes. I agree with you. I agree with you. I have many different relationships with my father, though. So th my dad is like an army soldier as well, because he's like the businessman, the yeah. shiny armoured guy like in my life. And whenever I've got a problem, issue, he's the guy. And he'll never go like, you know, be flustered or anything. He'll just be like, it's okay. We'll deal with it. Even if he's worried, because I know now from this point of view. But then... If I'm like going out with my dad, then he goes into friend mode and Sean's my friend. And he'll show that to his friends as well. So I, I do get a little bit of that side. And then sometimes we're on a badminton court together. Oh, nice. And But he's quite raw in badminton. Yeah. What were you doing? <laughs> Why didn't you get that? Like, I it, think that's it was, lovely. <laughs> you know, so I think it's really important to have so many different relationships mm. because, you know, he's the best man in my life. And so is my mum. That mum is very supportive. They have very different roles, but... You know, I see both of them as my friends. Like, I'm 36, going to be 37 next week. But it's like, I still feel that I'm like mummy and daddy's boy, you know, and I'm an adult. I've got my own life, but I, I love, you know, that friendship and bond I have with them also, you know. You're very blessed because um, a, lot, a lot of other Asian boys will be feeling your way. It's just the girls that don't. Yeah. Um, so I went to a networking event at Savoy's plugging you in some ways by the way <laughs> brilliant events they have and then um I, I didn't know a lot of people as well I don't network that's been a little bit of my downfall but I've, I'm one of them people wanting to put my head down and just work 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 and when I've got something to show for it or when I've got something in my bank account then then it's worth networking because I've got some money to talk about I know it isn't quite that way now and you know if people like you you can make things happen you can get lending but me I was a little bit old school that way but when I went to this networking event so many people come running up at me and they were like you're Sean right I've been watching all your stuff you're amazing and I love your dad because I got him on the camera. <laughs> so I was like, dad, okay. let me ask you a question. And my dad would just, man of very few words, but he'll, you'll, you'll think about it for about an hour. What did he just say? And so many people go, I love your dad. Do you know what? I've got closer to my dad since I've seen you with your dad. Oh, well, that's encouraging. And that's quite impactful, you know. Were they men that said this? It was one of them was men. Yeah. And there was a girl as well who came up to me okay. because I just love how you are with your dad and stuff. That's encouraging. But women do say that, you know, I wish the family was more supportive of stronger women and mm. women who want to choose entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's okay to be a, a strong woman. You know, it doesn't mm. mean that she's being disrespectful or anything that shapes sort of nature. The world is a very different place. Who can afford a half a million pound house on their own? So you want a strong woman next to you anyway. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. So um, after, you know, you've set this... Um, mobile phone shop did then you set up a cafe did you say no one of my tenants um okay because i was actually selling it was a tandy franchise you probably don't know who they are but it was an american franchise that sold parts for computers it was almost like um a, a part shop but they went they just went bust so i got to a point where i was working hard really hard and i decided it wasn't for me it wasn't what i wanted to do i could do what i was doing from home or from an office so I decided to rent out my property to somebody else who became a sort of real nice cafe bar, very at market. Um, and I let them look after the, you know, paying me rent. So I was getting that additional income as opposed to just me creating the income from that space. And I learned that that was the best option for all of the places because I'd 
you know, two shops. So I ended up renting them both out and going into the top of the place myself and using the office space and what I needed, which meant I was duplicating the income that I was probably going to make and, and, and it was a lot easier for me. Right. Okay. And your property journey, has it continued from there or have you no, just No, it been came to a standstill. I was one that really wanted to pay my mortgage off like the minute I got it. Um, a lot of people don't do that, but I had got the mortgage and at the end of each year I would pay a lump sum off, a lump sum off, a lump sum off that I would save up. Even if it was only a, a couple of thousand, I would do it because it was paying it off more than it you know, would done otherwise. So the house was paid off. All the properties are paid off. It's just I came to a point in my life where I had to leave. Um, and I didn't have any way of be building on that. Right. D are you happy you've got these places that are unencumbered right now and don't have any loans, or would you have wished to leverage and carry on growing? I couldn't carry on growing because of my partner that I had at the time. Right. He was very much... Um, he almost stunted my growth mm. with his ways that he was because I wanted to buy more property into Leicester for students. I was looking along along those lines, but he he was very greedy for money, so I had to pay him a wage, and his wage was quite high, whether I had the money or not. So if it wasn't for the person I was with, then that's another lesson. Yes. The person that's by your side, whether they're good or bad, you've really got to consider how they're going to help you grow, um, because if they're not helping you grow, then you know you get stuck in a certain place, which is how I did. What do you think when there's an imbalance in, in, in the partner? Like maybe you really love each other, but maybe one of you might have a business or one's more wealthier. I don't know if you saw in the newspapers uh, just this week, go on, it's just come to my head right now. There's a footballer, he's quite famous, but he's been accused of raping somebody. Um, it hasn't come to fruition, but in between, his wife's decided to leave him. Um, and she's filed for divorce and she wants half of his wealth and I think he's worth something like 80 million mm. she'd been shocked to find out that he's put everything under his mum's name everything down mm. to the and he just asks her for a little wage so I think he gets something like a million pounds a month or something like that he gets 200,000 as an allowance and says mum can I please have money okay. so now the situation is because she's a, a model from Paris she's on she's got a net worth of three million and the judge has decided she has to split her wealth with him now so by her going into this divorce she's actually half in her wealth but what I'm trying to say in the grand scheme of things is how should people, you know, protect themselves without being rude to their partner to say, look, we're coming together because we love each other. We want to build something together. Yeah. However, I've built something before you and this is my hard work determination, etc. But I don't mind sharing the proceeds, but it's mine. Like I've built this. Um, how do you tell a partner or, do, or don't you tell a partner and you just play it? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you see, I can do it from a personal perspective after what's happened to me. Yes. Um, I lost a lot of money. I lost my home. I lost one of the properties. And I ended up with, at the t time, it was the, the lesser value property. I just created value upon it. I could see that. But to him, he knew it was the lesser property. So he ended up with a better deal. Um I did it because I was sick of things and I just wanted time to move forward because I was not really at a place where I could even make decisions. I just wanted it done and dusted. I almost let go of all of that money, if I'm being honest, because it had a toxic kind of feel to it. I'm glad I held on to something, though, as opposed to nothing. And I would say that if you were to meet somebody tomorrow, like myself, for instance, I can only use myself as an example, I have built this and that's protected because that's mine, but what can we build together? And I would have honest discussions about this. I would have an honest talk because the problem is there's a lot of assumptions made because people don't ask questions. But if you do really love each other, you would never really want that from somebody anyway. You would never want to tear them down. You would never want to take from them. And then if, if anything, you would want to build with them and, and help them with their journey. Yeah. But doesn't that take away some sort of security for a woman? So a woman goes, I'm, I want you because I want you to provide for me and I want you to protect me. There are a lot of people that think know? that way, and, Sean. And, 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 a, and some women think like that and they go, look, I don't mind doing a little part-time job, but that's not my ambition. My ambition is to support you, um, give you beautiful kids and let's have a good life together. And, and that's it. This is the whole reason I'm here because I'm attracted to you. And yeah. You're amazing. But now you're saying we're going to be together, yeah. but you're not, you ain't got access. Like you don't have no ownership. 
some women get a little bit funny about that. They're like, well, what if you left me tomorrow? Then what am I left with, honestly? That's... And I know that's a negative way to look at life. Mm. But how do you deal with that? But that's why so many women stay in relationships when they're unhappy, when they are being abused, because they don't know how to make it on their own. So they rely on, on the male person to provide because men are seen as a provider. And a lot of my clients are men, remember, and they feel the pressure of having to provide. It's difficult for them. I think in modern day um, society, the way ideally it should be is that two people work together. That, you know what, honey, if you haven't done well this month, I've got the money, let's go and eat today. Let's not, not eat because you haven't got it. Yeah. But ideally every woman, I think, wants to be looked after it's just the way maybe we've been programmed we want that alpha male and also i think men want to feel that too they want to feel like they are the provider that they have the ability to provide that they can say to that lady or woman or whatever it is sit down honey i've got this you're going to sit down i'm going to do this for you i'm going to do that and even strong independent women like myself want that because you know it shows us our worth too yeah. it shows that we are of value but it doesn't mean that i can't sit with somebody and say What's going on? Let's try and sort it out. How can we work together to, to create a solution? And what can we build together? Maybe we can buy a property together. Or maybe if you've got a business idea, how about we create a business together? So I think it's communication is key. And I think honesty is a really, really big thing. But you should never rely on somebody else to provide for you, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, look, what if the dynamics change in a household and you're not the most you know, extrovert, you're a little bit introverted, your wife's a little bit more outspoken, for example, she's at the job, she's more successful, but the man still likes to feel that he's in charge, but he doesn't feel like that. So he's not feeling like that at home. And he's probably not feeling like that at work as yeah. well, because his manager probably says he's a bit quiet. I can get away with saying a few things or extra responsibilities. This is what leads to a lot of men having mental health yeah, as well so. because this, everything starts breaking down. They, they're not successful. And maybe we've been programmed like that. I we, think so. We, we should be. So um, how can we sort of change the sort of dynamics in the home environment? Because that's something you should be able to work on because obviously your partner should care about you and how you feel as a man. It doesn't mean you're better than them and you're bigger than them and you're stronger than them and you're going to overtake. You just... It's, it's just that little respect barrier that you just still feel that, ah, oh, she's giving me the respect. Even if she's a business owner and doing a lot better, what mm. advice could you give to sort of men and women out there on, on that? If you're not happy, leave. A lot of people are in relationships and they don't even know why they're there. And if it's causing you a lot of mental stress, if you're not happy when you're at work, be honest at least with yourself that if you're not happy, then... You know, you've got to find a way to be happy. People are working in jobs, they're not in the right jobs and they're not happy. People are in relationships, but they're not happy. A lot of the time because of children or because they think, you know what, I'm bordering 40, I'm not going to start again, I can't be bothered. Yes. And a lot of that comes into it. Or it's, if I don't settle with somebody soon, I'm going to get to an age and never meet anybody. And yeah. I've got someone now and she's not that bad. And they start to make excuses for women. And women can be very toxic, I know this completely from my clients and just by observing women can be very manipulative they can be very um aggressive as well in their in their attitude that if you don't do this you're not going to see so and so tonight you know and they put put the child to bed before you even get home deliberately to spite the person or you know they lay there and say they're not going to cook because they've got stomach ache and there's nothing really wrong with them but they're playing a game yeah. and unfortunately society has become this thing so I would say to anybody that you don't have to stay in a situation where you're unhappy. Know that you you deserve better, that you, you know, you're worth that. Because a lot of men don't feel like they're worth anything. A lot of men also don't want another person calling their kids, you know, you know, they don't want their kids going dad to somebody else either. And that can break a man when when the, if they were in that sort of situation. Um, and that's what keeps even I know we hear a lot of bad situations from women, but some men go for it as well, where women own them, control know, just, them. And, you know, the reason why they're just there is because they just don't want to lose access to their kids and everything that they've sort of built together sort of thing. I completely know. Um, but you see, the problem with that is the men will end up looking for something somewhere that they're not getting at home, just companionship, just understanding which will lead to extramarital affairs, which then bl the blame will then be taken upon the man and not the real understanding why he's doing it. Or it will 
push the person to a point where they become violent because their aggression isn't going anywhere. We all have feelings of emotions. So if they're bottled up to a point, someone's going to get that, going to be the brunt of that aggression, whether it's the partner or the children. Mm -hmm. And I think the children really suffer when they're in an unhealthy relationship. I didn't think my children noticed things because it was an impact on me from domestic violence, but they've suffered and they still are suffering from that. And now they're, you know, in their 20s. So it doesn't go away. So what children see and how they see um, a mother and father act in a family dynamic really impacts them for life. So you could be thinking you're doing the right thing, but actually you're creating a real trauma for your children going forward. And also how they see that relationship building is how they'll build their relationships. Yes. So I think everyone ends up suffering. They do, including the children. Wow. Yes, everything has like a knock-on effect, doesn't it? You know, you can't push something and not expect something out on the other side to not have an effect. That's 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 quite powerful. So, Nina, you've just explained quite a few stuff. Like you've you've built a couple of businesses, you've bought some houses, and obviously you've touched on a few other things. But so you started off with a some good mentorship at a young age, and uh, did you have good parents to sort of lead you to where you are today? Tell us from the beginning. In um, a real short sentence, no. <laughs> um, I'm, a, as well as being a mindset coach for UFC fighters and MMA fighters and boxers and now a few footballers um, who have gambling addictions, which is a really bad thing. We need to talk yes. about that sometime. Um, I was born into a Punjabi family like yourself, yes. but I was born a girl, not a boy. And I remember saying to a cousin recently, she's not a cousin, she's not a direct cousin, but I said to her recently, do you think if I was born a boy, I would have been treated differently? She said, oh, 100%, you would have been spoiled. You know, the sweets would have been handed out, the big party would have happened. But instead, you didn't get that, did you? And I just stayed very quiet when she said it. But the truth is that girls in my culture, as you know, might not have happened in your family, but would happen in every other family, don't welcome a girl when she's born because they see us as a disposable person, almost like not a real person, almost like a burden. Um, and my parents saw me as a bewitched entity, like a person that carried around an evil spirit because I'd brought them bad luck, they said, which is quite funny because Hindus, when they have daughters, celebrate them because they believe that she's Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, and that yes. she brings them wealth. But in my culture, it wasn't quite the case. Um, so I wasn't celebrated. I was not picked up from my pushchair and my chachi, who's an auntie told me they used to leave me in the buggy and, and when my mum first had me, that she would stop everyone and my father would stop everyone. So they would just let me cry. And the normal thing is when someone has a baby, you go around there, you pick the baby up, yeah. you, you know, say, oh, she's Put got your eyes. Down the top yeah. and stuff. It's just and, very traditional, yeah. you know, but nothing apparently was done. And I lay in that pushchair for days, soiled and fed. And eventually I stopped crying. Um and that led on to us moving to Leicester from Birmingham because that's where we were. How old was you when that happened? We moved to Leicester when I was six. Okay. Um, I have a few memories of Birmingham. Do, you, know. do, do you have um, brothers and sisters? I'm, I'm the youngest of two. So I've got two elder brothers, which is why had I been born a boy, I would have been really spoiled. Right. I thought yeah. they would have got their two boys and now they've got a little mix, no? No, obviously it didn't work that way. A lot of people pine for a girl. Um, but then equally a lot of people pine for boys, especially from my culture, whereby they still do um, scans to find out if it's a boy or a girl and they will abort if it's a girl. Wow. So it still goes on. Wow. And was there differences? So at six, you, you still got some memories from six years old? I've got very vivid memories from six years okay. old. Yeah, I, I was... Um, so was the, the treatment different between you and your brothers? Well, I was given quite a big room, actually, um, but it was on the side of the house as opposed to the main house because it was part of an extension, so I had that room. Um, but it was unfinished, as in the walls were unplastered, you know, when you have the... the render. Um, render. Okay. <laughs> um, so I had the rendering, and I didn't have any carpet. It was just boards. Floorboards. Floorboards. And I had a bed, but it didn't have any bedding. I didn't have pillows. It was very bare. When I say it was very bare, it was very bare. Even the door hadn't been smoothed it hadn't been sanded it was a very rough wooden door was it because your parents didn't have money oh no my father had money he was uh, very entrepreneurial he had money but it was just they didn't think it needed finishing because it was just for me 
So I wasn't given that privilege, wow. but my brother had, I remember he had a really nice green door. It was like an Oxford green door painted, really shiny with the gloss. And I used to wonder if they would get to paint mine, but as time had it, they didn't. And my job was very clear that I was to stay in my room 24 seven, really? unless I was going to school. Wow. So in unless, this household, you was really just not even, it was like you weren't part of the household. I, wa I wasn't part of, of the family. I think that's the right word. Oh I wasn't allowed to make eye contact like we are now because girls were taught, you know, and they still are, that you don't make eye contact with anyone. So my mannerisms were to keep my head down always and never look up. Um, so I became nonverbal in, in respects to, I would just grunt almost like, mm, you know, to say I understood if I was asked. But the words that they used were literally food, come and clean. And that's all my mum used to shout from the bottom of the stairs. And if they called my name, it would be Bhutani, which you might understand. means like, like ghost, witch or something? It means like a witch, like yeah. a possessed demon almost. Uh, and that was my name. That's what I responded to. And that's what I believed I was to a certain degree. Wow. Because that's what I was told. How was it when there was family gatherings and people from outside of the house would come? Was it, would you still treat the same first of all? And if you was, was it normal to everybody else as well? Is yeah. Is that how they were teaching, treating their daughters? Bottom line was yes. Um, my father's one of seven brothers. Um, he didn't speak to some of his brothers, but the ones he did speak to all accepted that I was this, you know, thing, um, not even a person to them. Um, a lot of them didn't acknowledge me. And even now, somebody came forward that I, I shared a stage with um, on International Women's Day that I realised and she realised that I'm her boa, which means dad's sister because she's her dad is my cousin brother directly my cousin but she didn't know anything about me and when she questioned her grandmother who's my dad's sister my boa um, she said we don't talk about her she, she does you know we just don't discuss her and she was really shocked that I had stood on stage and said this happens and that I was directly related to her and that she felt that more intensely because it was almost like a shunned topic. Nobody talks about it. She's nothing. She's no, she doesn't exist, even though we're blood. So when I was six, my job, as I said, was basically to come out the room to cook and clean. I um, didn't question it. What was the relationship from woman to woman, mother to daughter like? Any connection, any differences that maybe she might have felt, you know, a little bit of what you had felt and maybe she had any sort of compassion at all? I used to think she was scared of my father. I used to feel that, what could she do? You know, what what could she do? And I even remember saying to my daughter, we discussed death one day and I said, actually, you know, when Nanny dies, which means your mum's mum, when Nanny dies, she'll be free, free of all the pain she's had to deal with because I really felt she was put into a position until recently when I actually stopped making excuses and realized that she knew every step of the way what she was doing and there were moments she could have showed me love or an ounce of care but she chose also not to she was always very angry with me I don't know why but she had this huge amount of anger for me and a huge amount of love for my brothers and and they were sort of complete opposites do you think it's something that she had to go through as well, like in terms of maybe the whole family said it's because of you we've had this daughter and stuff like that and maybe that's why she was angry at you? Most definitely they would have said that. My dad said it many a time in front of me that, you know, um, you, you're the one who brought her here, so to speak. I told you to have an abortion because the pregnancy was different. He said it lots of times very openly. But my mum comes from a very loving family because her father went the little... Um, interaction I had with him was, was of a loving kind. He would hug you, he would hold you, he would, you know, joke with you. Um, but she wasn't like that. And whether it was because they get married so young and she was married to my father at a very young age that she became the person that she was around, I guess. Wow. That's, um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. So, but did things get better as you were getting older? No, my life literally went from just being the servant. Um, I didn't think there was anything wrong with my life because I knew where the girls had to do the food and the cleaning. I just didn't know they were allowed to sit on the sofa with their parents or that they were allowed to watch television. I wasn't allowed to do those things. So I started to realise a little bit that my parents are more strict. But you know what? The way our culture is, we just think that's the way it is as girls. You know, we're not allowed. And that was the thing. We're not allowed. I'm not allowed. I didn't have a choice, in my opinion, as a young girl. 
And then um, things started to change as I got into my teens because something happened that made me realize that life wasn't normal. So what happened? So um, my father used to go out on a Friday night or Saturday night as, as they did. Maybe your dad did the same, I don't know. But they'd go out and they'd drink and they'd bring back their friends and then the mother would normally prepare a meal. Um, in my case, it was me preparing the meal. So my father would go out and it was the same set of friends he would bring back. There were seven or eight of them. I knew them by by their voices. I knew the way they would cough. You know, I had an alerted a sense of hearing because my sight almost was taken away. And one particular night they came back. Um, they were very drunk and I could hear them when they came in. My mother woke me up to cook. I went down, made the normal chicken, rice, roti, chapatis, like you know, chicken curry. And chicken stuff. curry. And, um, you, and you, what, you'd make it fresh for them? Or? I'd make it fresh. You know, from the age of six, I was cooking. So I could barely reach the surfaces, but I would cook. And I say to people that maybe your favorite toy um, as a child was a car or something. But mine was this wo blue wooden crate. It was not wooden, it was plastic. So I crate that Pepsi bottles or drink bottles used to go. And I used to turn it upside down and stand on it. And that for me was, wow, you know, I've got this thing. It helps me to get to everywhere and I can be quicker. Everyone will be happier because I was a real people pleaser, you know, to a certain degree. Um, and that's all I knew. But when I came down this particular night, something in me was really stirring as I was cooking. I just didn't feel right. I didn't know whether it was because I was going through that hormonal change as growing up as a young girl. But I remember sitting on the stairs and we had a long wooden stairs. Um, it was light brown. And I remember playing with my slippers just sort of kicking them on and off, waiting for my dad to say, come and clean up. Um, because I wasn't allowed to sleep till it, all the dishes had been washed. But this particular night, I was kicking my shoe, and I remember it going a bit further, and I was trying to pull it in without making noise, but my stomach was almost, it was just churning. And I thought, why am I feeling this way? I don't feel right, I want to go to bed. And then I was called in, and my father was the first person to take me by my wrist, he threw me onto a low table. Um, the food went flying. The plates went flying. He was, he, he was drunk? They were all drunk, very drunk. Um, but I didn't say anything. I kept my eyes super tightly closed. I tried not to hear, but I obviously couldn't switch your hearing off. And he was the first person to rape me. Did you, like, as that age and you were quite innocent, did you know what was happening? No. No. Did you think they were just going to hit you? or? It was I thought I was being beaten. My dad would beat me regularly, so I thought it was the start of a beating. And um, it's only when they ripped my trousers, my pyjama bottoms off, that I realised something was wrong. I didn't know what was happening because I didn't understand about sex. We weren't taught about it. We didn't discuss it at home. But um, it hurt. <laughs> I was slapped, kicked, punched, bitten thrown from the table to the floor, somebody else would pick me up. And I was almost passed from person to person. And it was a really horrific type of rape. And I don't know what a normal rape is. I don't know what that is. But I just know this was more of a frenzied attack. And I was literally being thrown around like a rag doll. Mm. Wow. Um sometimes like you you look upon your parents and like people like your father to protect you you know and you're his little princess like um why do you think your dad allowed that to well why did he do that and why did he allow that to happen like with another guy to touch you and stuff it, i just there's to so much in this mix i don't know what to deal with first you know your dad doing it and you know, you're just a child. Uh, they didn't regard me as anything. I was a nothing. I was disposable. I was I was just nothing to them. He didn't see me as an extension of himself. He didn't see me as a child. Um, the way they spoke to me and treated me in the house wasn't that I was even a person. And your mum? Your mum, like, you know, that's her husband and what one, what she's doing and you're her daughter. Like, there's so many thoughts going in my head right now. Sorry, but it's just like, what was she thinking or doing? Like, did she think to protect you or get in there? Like, surely this isn't normal. Like, all right, they might have disowned you within that house and they didn't like you for certain reasons, but didn't your mum say, that's my daughter and I have to protect her 
is it? Which is like, you know, your honour as a woman and a child. Mm. Wasn't any of that spoken about? Or when didn't she come to rescue you? Like No. Um, eventually, they some people left. Um, some of them stayed behind and continued to rape me. And it went on and on. It just seemed to never end. And I know that I was passing out and coming to. Um, eventually, when I did wake up, it was because my mum had opened the door and slammed it a couple of times and she startled me. And I remember feeling pain that I can't even describe. Um, I was covered in blood. I was lying literally in a bath of my own blood. They, I looked up to one side and I could just see... So blood from where? Um, blood from everywhere. My my, I remember my neck was bleeding. I don't know whether I'd been bitten to a point where it was bleeding. Um, but I was bleeding from down below. Obviously, I'd been ripped as well. And um, I didn't really get it. I'll be honest. I just knew that it was wrong. I felt like I just didn't want to be anymore. I just wanted to disappear somehow. But there was nowhere to go. And I remember looking around thinking I'm going to be in so much trouble now. You know, that was my immediate thought, not what's happened to me or what have they done. I had no concern for me straight away. It was, oh, I'm going to be in so much trouble. I'll probably be beaten for it because the plates are broken. You know, I was a child. So I eventually got myself to my feet and I asked my mum if I could have a shower because I wasn't allowed showers. We had two or three bathrooms in the house, but I was only allowed a baldy bath, which means a bucket bath. It was almost like their way of saying, you're different to us. The boys are allowed hot showers, you're not. Did, did, did your brothers not hear anything or did they not know what happened? No one said anything. No one said anything. They were all asleep, so I'm sure they probably heard, but nobody said a word. And um, I asked my mum if I could have a shower. She said to go and shower and to come back down. And that when I came out of the shower, she'd left my brother's pyjamas there. And she asked me to bring my clothes because they were ripped. She took them from me, threw them away, and um, asked me to clean up. So I took a bucket and started to clean up. So, did this become a habit once this happened once, or was it something that was never spoken about again? And something you just moved on from, you know, what, what what happened sort of next? I stayed in bed for quite a, a few days, didn't go to school, didn't do my chores, didn't cook, didn't clean. And no one checked up or called No up one on checked you. on me. And then I think it was, I would say three, I don't know what it is, I mean three, but I would say three days, I don't know. Um but eventually I went back to school. And when I went to school, I was a totally different kid. I didn't sit at the front. I sat at the back. Sometimes I'd sit on the floor and cry. School wasn't really an escape from me, but I loved learning. I loved books. I loved the travel to school. You know, the journey used to be fun, but that wasn't fun anymore. I um, just became very disengaged with everything. But nobody said at the school what's happened. And I was desperate for someone to ask me. No, they you could notice, do. no teacher noticed that one Nobody minute asked. you're at the front, happy child, and next minute you're right at the back, all quiet. I always saw myself as a problem. Do you think at that time there was any racism or anything like that? Yeah, the school I went to was a very white, dominant um, school. So everybody was white British, apart from myself and my brother. And there was one Greek girl. But I would be beaten every lunchtime or playtime or my brother would be. We took it in turns almost. So I had no friends really. People would spit at me, pull my hair, you know, with the ding-dong jokes, call me names. So outside of the house environment, were your brothers any different with you? No. No. I would sometimes go when a fight was going on and I knew it was my brother to try and help. I don't know what I could do, but it was my instinctive thing to go. But I couldn't do anything. You know, he would often have four or five people on top of him beating him up. And he was a big guy, but he obviously couldn't fight off as many. But the teachers didn't really do anything about it. They would just let it happen. Um, but it got to a point where 
as I started turning 15, I was just muddling through life. I was really depressed, if I'm being honest, looking back now. I was doing my job still in the house. My period stopped and I realized that, you know, I must be pregnant from this rape. And um, when I told my mum, um, she attacked me with um, a pair of scissors because she was um, a seamstress at home. She used to, cut, um, cl you know, sew clothes at home. And I remember going up to the machine and having my head down and I said to her that my periods have stopped and I don't feel very well. And she just attacked me. She was really angry, so angry with me that I was quite surprised because she'd never done that before. And um, she called my father, told me to go to my room. She called my father. He came straight away. And they sat me down and um, they just kept saying things in Indian like swear words and that I'd brought shame upon the family and what were they supposed to do now? It's hard enough as it is having a girl and to have a girl like you. They were saying things like that I had tainted my father's white turban. He didn't wear a turban, but it's a figurative speech. Um, and I felt really bad about myself. I felt like, why am I always a problem? Why can't I do anything right? You know, at school I used to think, why am I not one of those white British boys? Why do I have to have this life? I don't like who I am. And my self-hate started to really grow from there to the point where I just couldn't stand myself. Um, my father and mother took me to a private clinic to have an abortion. I remember the journey really clearly because I hardly went anywhere with them, especially in the car. And I remember going and I remember the procedure. I remember how I felt. But what I remember the most, and I say this all the time, is that when I sat on the grass verge at the end, they make you sit on a grass verge and your gown that they give you, a lady with blonde hair um, leaned forward and I remember sort of sheepishly looking to my side and seeing her hair hanging down and she handed me a cup of tea with a biscuit. But she stroked my hair in a very maternal way. And I thought, well, how bad can you really be if somebody is touching you? But my mum had never brushed my hair my mum had never stroked me in that way or held me and I just felt an immense amount of love from this small act of kindness that really stayed with me and I started to question are you bad are you really this bewitched person are you really this evil spirit I had a habit of talking to myself um having no interaction with anyone else I would talk to myself I had inner dialogue a conversation literally going on all the time and I remember getting home that day and on the way home, my mum and dad were saying that they're not going to be able to show their faces in public. Nobody will want me. They don't want me. And I sat in the back and I thought, I don't want me. I don't want me at all. Um, so I decided when I went home that night that I would the next morning take an overdose and try and kill myself. Right. And, and, and is that what you did? Yeah, I um, got... In those days, we had packs of paracetamols, not packets. I took a pack. I didn't know what I was doing. I lay down and thought, well, this is it. Um, gave my dog a kiss and, and thought that would be finished. But nothing happened. Um, my parents found out what I'd done because I hadn't gone downstairs to, to cook or anything. So my, they all started to beat me up again. And I, I just received another beating for it. Um, and I was left on the top of the stairs from that. Wow. Wow. Okay, so you know, when did start things start getting better from fifteen? Then, <laughs> well, from fifteen, I was told to come downstairs one day because one of the uncles, not obviously related, but we say uncle to people that are older than us in our culture. Yeah. Um, it was one of the men that stayed right to the end that was really biting me. He had come back and said he had a solution because I couldn't have an arranged marriage because I wasn't a virgin. So my father was thinking at the time to maybe send me to India to get me to marry an older man. But he said, I've got a great solution. My son is seeing a white lady, you know, a white girl, um, or a gaudy as they say. And, you know, he can't really marry her. So I've got a solution. If she comes into our house, the community will stop picking on him not being married because he's got to a certain age. Your daughter will be married, but she'll be there for me. 
and I will have her and we will use her as a servant. And they said this all in front of me. His wife is there with him. I can hear her voice. I've got my head down. And they place a chunni, which is like a scarf on my head. And they say, this is the engagement. And it's all happening very quickly. But my dad's really happy. He's really happy. His wife's happy. My mom's happy. And I'm thinking, what does happy mean? What is happy? And um, they're giving me sweets in my mouth, giving me money in my lap, which was taken away afterwards. But I was really confused. And then the arguing started between them where my new father-in-law that was going to be was arguing with my father saying, if this secret is to be, stay quiet, you need to pay me for it. And they started to have this bartering thing where my dad was paying him. And there was a trade that took place of thousands and thousands of pounds, thousands and thousands of pounds in jewelry and gold, thousands of pounds in uh, machinery, you know, like washing machines, dishwashers. You know, those things were new in those days. So they were expensive microwaves. And I ended up getting married just as I turned 16, coming to 17. And as I entered the house, my mother-in-law told me to take all my clothes off. She gave me an old suit and took me to a little room, which was at the downstairs. And I thought, bedrooms are normally, normally upstairs in our, in our house. It was a really small house compared to my father's. Um, and it was a really small room where I was told, this little bed is yours. There was no door. There was like a wardrobe on the outside without doors and they said I would sleep there and that would be my quarters so to speak they would all sleep upstairs and when I needed to cook I was close to the kitchen close to the bathroom where I would wash clothes because they didn't have a washing machine um, and the one my father gave to them they gave to their daughter so we ended up with me doing all of the laundry again and um, time went on every day you know I was pulling his hands out of my underwear and pushing him off me. I didn't speak to my husband that was on paper. He didn't really have anything to do with me. But Did it was, he know what was going on? Yeah, he knew exactly what was happening. He just turned a blind eye, as did um, his younger brother that was there. I think the younger brother probably was too young. He was quite young. But this would all be done. And he's, like your mother-in-law, she knew everything about My mother-in-law was really, again, angry, another angry person. But that's what I was used to, right? My mum was angry. She was angry. I thought, that's how women are, angry. Um, she really humiliated me by doing things like um, deliberately taking any clothes that I had for work away as well and giving them to her daughter, giving me old things. She would take all of my wages. My wages went straight into their account. Um, they forced me to get a job, which was to their detriment, really. But she would when I was cooking and I would plate myself something, she would take the plate and literally throw it into the bin and then pull me, literally pull me by my clothes and say to me, if you want to eat, eat out of the bin because this isn't your father's house. And at first I started to, but I gave up after a bit because it was so humiliating. All I'm seeing right now, there's four adults here involved, your mum, your dad, you know, um, your partner at the time who's non-existent their mum and dad and they've just negotiated a deal like you're a piece of meat basically you had no f faults feelings um a situation was at the fault of your fathers and your father's friends that were all involved in this sort of situation and then they've come in like big shining arm and said we'll resolve this and none of this was at the fault of your own how can your mum sit there and watch you, her daughter being sold as an old man, sort of, you know, something to satisfy him? And how can this your mother-in-law be negotiating this deal? I think they all wanted to get rid of me in the sense of, I think my parents wanted me to be someone else's problem because they saw me as a problem from birth. Um, and these people were really respected in the community. You know, they're one of the bunch Biado, which means in the temple he represented um one of the main figures there so i could never say anything because who would believe me who was i to believe he was such res a respected person as was my father that had i even spoken out people would have just laughed and said that she's making it up and i i really believed that nobody i had nowhere to go wow so like some of the people that we go to in the gurdwaras and temples you know, people who are in charge up there, there are some of these people? Yeah, these... definitely. And you think they are hiding 
behind this false stamp. It's a mask. It's a mask. And often people don't represent the religion. They represent the culture. And that's where we're going wrong. The religion is, most religions are all about love and giving and being a good person. Yeah. But the people that run these churches, as we know, we've had how many reports of Christian churches, Orthodox churches where boys are abused. Um, and in our churches, we've had women and girls come forward where they've been touched inappropriately. But it's more difficult to say it because there's a stigma attached from our culture. Um, but often people will use their place of power to commit crimes because they feel almost to an arrogance they can get away with it. Mm. I do have to say on a flip side, you know, I had my grandma and granddad there. I had three uncles. One had seven kids, one had six kids. We were of five. We all grew up together. We went on shops and stuff. And, and thankfully, we none of us honestly didn't go through anything like that. We were always, um, if if we if it wasn't our dad, it was Tayaji or Nikatai or Vadata, which is your dad's older brother or second yeah. oldest brother, or Papaji, which is my granddad. He was like actually, you know, just as close as my dad. I'd hold his finger all the time, and he'll teach me in the shop, you know. Um, but I kind of feel guilty that I've had that sort of lifestyle, and you've had something totally different and I, I and I can't make sense of this I really can't because for you you say this stuff happens but I've never seen it in my community I've never seen it friends in uni and they're from different caste systems I've, I've never really heard of this sort of scenario it's really is this something that happens up north or <laughs> well, I'm no, from London. It's, like, um, it's just really shocking to yeah. hear this for me and I'll be honest like I really wanted to find out about this because about three weeks ago I opened up my social media and I went on to Facebook and you came up. And I'm telling you, you're like this light of energy, this this ball of energy that just attracts you because I'm not going to call you depressing yet because sometimes <laughs> I, I don't like watching stuff like that because I'm not an emotional person. Because when I don't think with emotions, I can think at my best. Might not be the the best or right thing but I know how to sort of deal with it but I saw you and you started telling your story and I swear to god I didn't have time but it was 33 minutes in and I was still watching your story you just had something about you that it was just I can't believe this has happened to you okay it's gonna get better and then I can't believe this has happened to you but there's light at the end of the tunnel and um so we haven't even finished your story, like so I don't even want to go through the rest of it. But it's just so unbelievable, and you're the definition of strong, and also the definition of something called change. You're so strong. It's like something that we teach is, you know, when you see pain, you need to go through pain. You can't just touch pain and run back because this is what a lot of the society does. And then they go, oh, it wasn't for me or it wasn't made for me or I couldn't do this. You've done it in a totally different way, et cetera, as well. But it's just so touching and inspiring. And the reason why I call you change is because you can change so many lives by showing them as a human. Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to retell, retell, retell. And I think I said to you at one point as well, you know, I need a break. Mm -hmm. I'm emotionally very drained at the moment, which is true. Um, but I know how important it is to open this wound up for other people to heal through that pain. So I keep doing it for that reason. And every time I do open up, more people come forward. And the video you saw reached, now it's 23 million. 23 million. So 23 million people have either been educated or they don't feel alone. But I've had over 9,000 messages of please help me from men, young girls as, um, as young as eight that have been trafficked from Peru. Mm -hmm. I've had so many people come forward. Even last night I was helping somebody. And I don't want that for anyone. I've suffered. I don't want anyone else to suffer. So I'll do whatever I can to make everyone know that there, there is somebody out there for them. And that's me. Is that your purpose? That's definitely my purpose. You know, in our in our religion... Um, I'm not super religious, but I believe there's a higher source and we should be of service to others. And that's the way I live my life. I don't call it a religion. I call it as a way of life. That's just the way we should be to serve others, to love others. We've lost compassion. We've lost the ability just to love one another. And I'm, I'm trying to, <clears throat> trying my best and I am doing it. I'm loving the fear out of everyone because that fear cripples them. 
Yes, of course. It's weird because I, f- I see so many selfish people around, you know, yourself. It's, you notice it most when you need anybody for the smallest thing. Because normally I'm all right in my own bubble. I'm in my own car hmm. and my own meetings. And you're meeting people who are going to benefit each mutually from, from each other. But then the minute is like, hey, in one minute, like I'm on the train, for example. So I'm, I'm relying on a train service. And next minute, oh, I forgot something. And you just ask somebody for a quick favor. Excuse me, could you? And especially in my position, I wouldn't really need to ask somebody. Yeah. And the amount of 20 no's you get or people just looking at you in a weird way, like get away from me. It's just like, wow, where is community gone? No, it's out the window. It's like seeing somebody being bullied on, on a tube for instance there's ways you can get involved without getting involved you can ask somebody the time just to take away that you know or say do you know what the next stop is or um do you know if i can get through this carriage or something anything just to sort of stop that harshness that's going on because there's a lot of abuse and people don't step in they'd rather not step in and it happened to us a few weeks ago where somebody said something to my son actually nobody spoke up obviously i was there my daughter was there so that was enough but i was not really surprised but I know that if somebody else was being even racially abused or picked on I would stand up for it or if somebody was being treated in a bad way I would say something not in a harsh way but there's always ways to say things that can help another person how do we bring community back love love and compassion is the only way we've become a very detached desensitized community that people look on social media and they compare you know, comparison is the thief, as they call it, and it's taken away a lot of people's identity. Everyone tries to look the same. I keep calling the world a fake and filtered world because that's exactly what it is. And I believe that whoever is testing us is throwing in all these objective things like filters and social media and social distancing, and we're all falling for it instead of swerving through it to keep going to the end of the game. And I think we just need to stop teaching one another to love a little bit more to hug not to cross over the road when you see somebody cough people still do it it's it's ridiculous Mm, yes so nina going back to your story you're in this your your in-laws house now you know they they, they've got a different room for you that they're mistreating you and abusing you where does it go from there yeah so i'm gonna rush forward (laughs) um i ended up having to get a job because they insisted i worked and i ended up being one of the youngest people of colour um, working in a large corporation to get a managerial job at 17. Wow. But I did it because I was people-pleasing again, wanting to make sure I earned enough to give them the money so maybe they'd like me more or maybe they'd get off my back. But at work, I was opened up to different cultures, different people, and there was a Punjabi girl there that worked um, in my department and she was dating a Nigerian guy. And they both seemed really nice. Both of them got my culture. He got it as well. She got it. And I kind of saw her as an extension of me that I could talk to. And I turned up once with bleeding ankles because my father-in-law would strip me and tie my ankles with a coat hanger, a metal coat hanger, and the edges would dig into my skin. And there was no way of stopping that blood flow. And um, I, I said that to her and I said, it's, it's to make me stay in one place so that I don't ask for help. And I was really scared at that time because in the eight, in 90s, sorry, 80s, I'll go back to 80s, yeah, um, there was this thing called the Burning Brides in Leicestershire and I think in other places where they would call a girl from India or have an arranged marriage here if she didn't provide a boy as an heir. They would pour petrol over and set her light. The police would arrive and they would say, well, it was a suicide and the police would say, it was cultural, let's go. And then they would get the girl, mar- a boy married again in the hope that the next bride would provide a boy. And I was paranoid because I could hear the screams where I was living. And it was a really small area. So I decided that I would listen to these two people at work and go back home because I was older. I didn't have anywhere else to go. I didn't have the courage to step away from the community because then I would become a victim of being cut off. When did you realise this was wrong, what was going on? So when you were like going to your in-law's house and you didn't have a relationship with your husband and you were being raped, like, because obviously if everyone in your environment close is saying this is what needs to happen, when did you realise it was wrong and started talking to people and what were their reactions? I'll be honest, I didn't know it was wrong. I just didn't. I just felt it didn't feel right. I didn't like the way it felt. I didn't like him on me. 
Um, it was almost like a torture of sorts that I had to endure every time I was near him. And I would flinch. I was scared. I just didn't want it anymore. Um, I was desperately unhappy. And I just wanted to be loved. I literally wanted to go home. My mum and dad just to put their arms around me and say, we've not been the best parents, but you know what? You don't have to put up with this anymore. You can live with us. That's all I wanted. And I decided one day I would go back home. And I said to my friends, I'm going to do what you said. I got the courage because it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy decision. What did your friends say when you told them about the situation? They were encouraging me. They were saying, you know, you need to leave. You're not a young kid anymore. Your parents will look after you. And she was telling me about her parents. But, you know, not everyone's parents are on the same mindset. Like yours are very different. I've come across many that are very different. But I've come across many people that have literally got my life story as well. Wow. Um, there are millions out there and that's no exaggeration at all but I ended up going back home and when I got back home they knew I was coming because somebody from the community had seen me getting on the bus going home and she was I don't know why she's on the bus coming to your house she's not going to her in-laws and my mum and dad were waiting for me you know they literally were waiting for me my father actually I've never said this before opened the door with a baseball bat in his hand and I thought oh well why why you know has he got a baseball bat and before I could even say Daddy G, which is a respectful way of saying Daddy, um, he grabbed me because I used to wear a ponytail in those days and he literally pulled me in and threw me onto the same carpet upon which I was raped. And I instantly knew that I've just made one of the biggest mistakes of my life. But I couldn't go anywhere. My mother stood there with her arms crossed. My sister and all my Bobby stood there with her arms crossed. And one of my brothers wasn't there. The other brother was. He was six foot tall. My dad's an ex-professional wrestler. And they just started to beat me, but I'd been beaten day in, day out in that house, but this wasn't the same type of beating. This was so furious. It was just very, almost like they had determined between themselves they were going to kill me that day. And I was really flimsy as a, you know, I was a really sort of feeble girl. I was 21, but I hadn't been eating. I developed an eating disorder because of the way my mother-in-law had subjected me to almost the lack of food. Um... I was literally being thrown around and my father started to punch and, and really, really beat me. But my brother broke my jaw, uh, my father broke my arm. And then when I fell down, they started to say the most horrible insults about me um, that I still carried for a long time after the bruises had healed, you know, because those words stay with you. Um they started to stamp and kick me. And then when I was lying down, my father put his foot across my throat. And that's when I felt I had left my body completely. I almost felt I was in a different place looking from the outside in. I was just this crumpled up little girl, lifeless, you know, just lying there covered in blood again. I had cuts and bruises everywhere. Um, my eye was swollen. And I remember looking at myself and saying, this is it. But then something else came and said, this isn't it you you're not it's not your time and I felt a real weird feeling and I remember being back in my body and watching blood drip off my nose because my head was bleeding into the carpet and I didn't feel their fists anymore or their harshness of their kicks I was just focused on this blood dripping into the carpet and watching it make this swirly design and I was completely lost and I, I think at that point I was passing out coming to then my other brother came out of nowhere and he was like stop 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 not here it's tinny which means not here he said we'll take her to india we'll finish her there and they all just left really quickly and i remember feeling quite stunned i was in exceptional pain all of a sudden the pain came the the threshold was you know gone and i couldn't move and that that carried on they just left me there for days sean and when i came to it's because I was starting to come to and listen to things. I could hear noises every now and then. I was seeing flashes every now and then. But I was literally a broken person. And one of my mum's friends, who was kind, opened the door. And she said, they're going to send you to India on Sunday. And I was like, I have no idea what day it is. I don't know where I am at this moment in time. Am I even alive? I didn't know anything. So your mum's friend, what, wasn't there a lock on the door? Or no, it was how? just a front room door. You know, we have a room for guests. I, this all happened in the guest room. Right. Um, they were in the other room and she'd come to see my mum, but she'd snuck in and, and said this. And then um, I thought to myself, because I just had this inner dialogue, saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to just give up? And I was like, yeah, I just can't do this anymore. I don't do you want... talk to yourself? I do. I still do. 
Uh, I said, are you going to let this happen now? What's going to happen? And I was saying to myself, no, I want to live. And I didn't even know why I wanted to live. I had no idea. I had no understanding of life, really. This is all I ever knew, abuse. But I wanted to live and I managed to not crawl because I tried crawling. I managed to use this part of my arms, shuffle forward, get to the door. Then I couldn't reach the, the door handle. It was impossible. Everything seemed impossible mm -hmm. until I did it. Yeah. And that would encourage me to go a bit further. I would get a bit further thinking, I can't do this, but I did it. And then I was scared because the house was full of angry people. And if they heard me, it would take them seconds to just finish me off. But the real test came when I managed to get into the garden to get over the fence because I couldn't go out the front door. And um, my fence was six foot tall and we had a dog, as I, as I mentioned, and she was the loudest dog in the, I tell you, she was so loud. People would complain, we would complain. Um, but I loved her and she came and sat right near me and she didn't say a word and her ears were down. I remember her ears being down, which would happen if she was told off, but she had her ears down and I remember touching her nose, because of, you know, her wet nose saying, please don't. And I think I even said, please don't because she, I knew if she barked, that would be the end of it. But she looked at me and she looked up and people laugh at this and say, well, she's talking to you, but maybe she just encouraged me. Maybe I just needed that sign from somebody, something good. And I looked at her and I thought, yes, I can do this. And I managed somehow to get over the fence, but I fell with such a thud. I thought, that's it, they're going to hear me, but they didn't. I made it across the road to a small park and I passed out. And when I woke up, it was like early hours of the morning. Somehow I forced myself to get to a taxi rank, which wasn't very far. The guy there was really kind and he could have been some weirdo. I could have really gone down a different way, but... Um, he covered me up with a blanket, asked me what happened. I said, my dad's trying to kill me. It's a non-killing. And he said, oh, I've heard of them. Um, and he said, where do you want to go? To the hospital, to the police? And I said, no, no, I want to go to my friends. I've got no money. They'll pay you. And he took me to my friend's house, but they weren't there. So he took me to the police station. I remember him saying to the policeman that there's no charge and to look after me. He was really kind. He disappeared. The policeman was this jolly white guy, you know, and he, his name was PCP. I remember it. I felt it was like a cartoon character almost. And he started to write down, write, and she and started taking pictures of my jaw. I looked like something out of a horror film. I was smelly because I'd soiled myself. I'd been laying there for days. You know, I was completely drenched in uh, all sorts, you know. And he, he was really quite pitiful is probably the right word. But as soon as I used the word honour killing, attempted honour killing and I said I left an arranged marriage he threw my file down and said let's just get you to a hospital and I thought is he going to come back and ask me questions what's going to happen I got to the hospital and I was there for two months two months nobody asked me how are you where's your family what can we do for you let's get some social services involved or somebody nothing because my file had a yellow sticky note on that said honour killing on it so nobody wanted to, to even ask me a question. When the doctors would come, they'd look at that. They wouldn't even open the file. They would do my observations with the nurse and go. Basics. I was then put into a women's refuge, which I couldn't hack because I didn't know about women taking drugs or smoking or drinking because our community, I never saw that. So I was scared by these women. And I ended up asking the person that ran that place for some money at bus fare which I got and I ended up back at my friend's place and it was daytime and her boyfriend opened the door or rather her ex-boyfriend then and he said you know what me and Bal we split up she went off and ended up having an arranged marriage I don't know why she went but you know what you can stay what happened to you oh my god you look really bad what happened and I thought oh he really cares because he's asking me a question and um, it could have been anyone it could have been somebody a uh, hippopotamus with pink dots if they'd said you can come and stay I'd be there to stay I just need somewhere to go yeah. um, he said I had to pay him rent which I said that's fine but I can't work I've still got a sling on and he said yeah yeah you, you can owe me and and you know it's uncomfortable being around him but it was better than where I'd been and it got to a point where we were invited to a party. I'd never been to a party. I was super excited, like, I'm going to a party. You know, somebody's actually asked me to go. And um, at the party, was handing me Coke. I'd never really had fizzy drinks, if I'm being honest. I had water. I think I'd had Coke once. Um, and he handed me Coke, and I said it tasted a bit weird. He said, hey, Diet Pepsi, that's all they've got, don't worry. And I trusted him, because why wouldn't I? But when I got home, I don't remember anything until... 
a few months later and I realized I've been raped and I'm pregnant. And I thought to myself, things happen for a reason. He said, get rid of the baby. I said, what happened? He didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't push because who was I to push? I was this quiet person that had no self-confidence. But suddenly I could feel this child in me and I wanted that. I wanted something for me selfishly. And it's against our culture to have any kind of relationship with somebody out of your own. But none of that seemed to matter anymore. All that mattered was I was holding some life form in me. And um, when I gave birth to my daughter, I felt I'd broken the cycles of not celebrating a girl. And I promised her I will give you everything I've never had. You will have private schooling. You'll have the best schooling. You will have anything. I will teach you such confidence. You will have skills. You will be whatever you want to be and I will support you and I will give you that much love. You'll never doubt yourself. And I thought, in my culture, if you have a baby with someone, you stay with them. You don't go and have a baby with someone else or someone else. You stay with that person of whatever they are like. And he wasn't a good partner. You know, he would go out. He would obviously be seeing other people, but that was something that was something I was used to. And my dad did it. You know, I wasn't really questioning him. Who was I to question anything? And I ended up having another boy, um, a baby. I had a boy. And he seemed happier when I had the boy. And I thought, this is good. And I started to look for, you know, by this time I'd bought a house. I started the businesses. So things were starting to, from the outside, look like we were one little happy family. But So you got into a relationship with this guy then, once you knew you were having the kid? Well, or... I don't know how you define relationship, but I only know that now. At the time, I thought it was a normal relationship when someone forces themselves upon you and they feel like it. Or you sit at a table together, but you don't really talk, but you're eating. Or you you know, he had no interaction with the children. He didn't go to any school events or any plays or anything. I remember my daughter, bless her, would always get me to buy her, her dad a ticket and she'd constantly be looking up to see if he was entering the theatre to see her um, her shows, but he rarely made it. So there was no family unit, but I didn't, he was around. You know, it was all a weird kind of environment, but I didn't know any better. Mm. And I wasn't one to question. I was so fixated on making money that I kind of took away from what he was doing as well. And I thought maybe one day he would love me. I asked him if we could get married and he said, you're not good enough to marry. So I accepted that. Um, I wanted the same surname as the children because I didn't want to be seen as people, as, you know, being almost like the not, not their parent. But I, I dismissed a lot of it because of the way I had no self-worth. Did you have to move out the area from where you were before? No, this area was very white dominated. My parents were probably nearly 20 miles away. Nobody knew I was there. It was quite a safe environment. There weren't many Asians. So nobody would tell my parents we saw her. I kept myself to myself, work, home, work, home was all I did. So I didn't really have any reason to be scared although I knew they were still searching for me because I would get an odd message from a cousin and, you know, he would warn me that, you know, your dad's still searching, your dad's still searching. And actually, something I never say, but I'll say very quickly, when my daughter was born, they found out about her and they put on wigs. They tried to buy my landlord out by offering him money for where I was because they wanted to abduct her and kill her. Your daughter? My daughter. Yeah, it was my brothers and my father. And the landlord put them off and said that she moved ages ago. Wouldn't it, look, I know the situation wasn't good for you, but wouldn't it just have been easier for them to just give you up for adoption as a kid if they didn't want you, rather than go through all of this for you and for them? I don't, I can't answer that. I'm not them. Um, I don't know why. And I don't know why so many other women have my story. They might not have every element of it, but they've got so many elements of not being wanted. Even the lady today that I was speaking to just before here, her parents hated to that point. They are searching, they're hunting her down to kill her because she's left this arranged marriage and that brings shame upon them from the community. And that matters so much to them that they will murder their own blood for that. And that's still happening today. It's happening today, literally. Wow. Wow. I ended up... Uh, uh, okay, yeah. So I ended up getting pregnant for the third time. With and the same guy? The same guy. Um, you know, I'm trying to make this work. I, I know he doesn't want to be with me. We don't go on dates. We don't hold hands. We don't kiss even. It's really quite difficult between us. Um, there's no attraction from him or me. And I know that. But he's going along with it because I've made a lot of wealth by now. Um, which goes on to your first thing that you're talking about, the wealth thing and, and couples. 
Um, he didn't work. It was just me. So I was opening business after business after business to provide schooling, education, living the life of luxury that I wanted, that I felt I deserved and my children deserved. I was teaching them, this is what you deserve for when you're older. How did you know about entrepreneurship? How did you know how to open a business up? Or how did you learn and where were the avenues that or people that helped you? Because, you know, one minute you're w working, you know, for somebody else doing a process. How did you know there was this thing called entrepreneurship and you can do it on your own? I honestly didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I've done a lot of things just because... I have a vision, a goal. I know that if I can make £10,000 by the end of this month, I can pay for this. So it's always meeting your needs is in a way. So I find ways to do that. I just always have. Uh, and maybe also try to prove my worth to my father or whoever's around me, my partner at the time, that, look, I can do this. You know, I'm a good person. Look at me. I can make this happen. Um, and I think that's just because I was driven for certain reasons. I was doing it for my children at one point. I was doing it for myself as a young person trying to prove to my father so there's always been a drive somewhere is it your why you have to have a why to to do something i only found my why recently so i can't even put it down to that i know a lot of people do that and i i think when you're good at certain things you're good at everything but that's only because you believe you are and what's kept you going what's that being been that thing that there's something always there that tells you you're hungry or a situation is wrong there's something always there like what do you think is that thing that keeps you motivated just to keep going with with every challenge that you have I mean now it's um I have people like I had to find money for this girl yesterday to accommodate her and her son and it's for having that money so now I know that the more wealth I have the more I can give so it's never really been about me I've actually the poorest I've ever been you know, I was a millionaire six years ago before I became homeless. But I ended up with nothing. I ended up literally with nothing. Um, How did you become homeless? Um, well, with my partner, as I go back to that, um, as I said, I got pregnant for the third time. Yes. Um, the violence was escalating. He was starting to set my pillow on fire as I was asleep. My daughter had to put it out. He set my hair on fire and the smell of burning hair is very unforgettable. Um and I developed, again, another fear of fire again from before. Coming forward, he would lock us in our rooms at 11 o'clock at night and reopen them at 5, so I stopped sleeping altogether. And um, my daughter had gone off to university. Sorry, I keep jumping. Okay, third pregnancy. I ended up um, having this third pregnancy, and, I, and he, he said this would be it. I wouldn't have any more children because I wanted three because I was one of three, and I've got this weird thing about number three. And um, I was pregnant and he was angry because I didn't have the money he wanted. He was going on a night out. I didn't have the money he wanted to hand. You know, sometimes there's that slight delay. And he was really angry and he, and he developed this way of getting rid of his frustrations by pushing me. He would push me into the wall. He would push me when I was in the car against the um, passenger window. He would push me down the stairs and he pushed me down the stairs when I was seven months, seven and a half months pregnant. And he walked out. And I lay there for a while and I started to feel a foot coming from me. And um, to cut a long story short, I got to the hospital and gave birth to my third child, Tyler. But he died shortly after birth. Mm -hmm. And I'm laying there and I can hear everyone else's babies crying, but mine's not. And I'm saying, why is he not crying? You know, and um, it was probably the hardest point of my life if I'm being honest or one of the hardest um, where I just wanted to give up I literally just didn't want to look after my children didn't want to run any businesses um, the funeral was organized by the hospital because he wouldn't do anything and I ended up just changing as a person until I got pregnant again when he said that he would not come near me he finds me disgusting no man would love me that I'm fat I'm ugly and I ended up giving birth to my son who kind of saved me in a way, he kind of almost rekindled that desire to live again. Um, it's really difficult to explain unless anyone's lost a child, but your arms are forever wanting to cradle that baby. Um, and then my daughter went to uni. My middle son stood up to his dad because he was getting sick and tired of me being spoken to or beaten. And as I said, children are really affected by this. He was doing his GCSEs. 
And he stood up to his dad. His dad didn't like it. And when we were facing one way, his dad came downstairs and punched him in the back of the head. And I said, you can't do that to him. You can't hit my children. Um, and he said, oh, you know, we just got into a bit of an argument. And I never spoke back. It was the first time I spoke back. But when it's your child, it's slightly different. Um, but my solution, again, distorted thinking. I didn't think very straight back then. I sent him off to boarding school, which meant I had to earn more to... to provide because his boarding school was very expensive um he went off to boarding school i opened two or three more businesses and my youngest son is being neglected but i'm not seeing that he's also dropped from his football team because he's developed this illness but we don't know what it is and it's just him and me a lot of the time you know and he's i've took him to the hospital and we find out he's got an autoimmune disease which is a disability so we can't play football he's not going to be one of the fastest people and the Midlands anymore, a 100-meter sprint. He's not going to be playing the game that he's played since he was two and a half. He, His life has changed. He's not got his brother to bounce off anymore. He's on his own. And um, we came out of hospital after a, quite a serious operation, and his father never visited him once, but he took a picture of us and sent it to my daughter, who was in a lecture. She got this picture of me asleep on the sofa, he was slumped over a table and she instantly knew there's something wrong here. The way he was positioned, the way I was sleeping, it was daytime. I had insomnia, I didn't sleep. And she's just had this gut feeling that we were dead. Wow. And she tried to ring us. She didn't ring the police, she rang us. She rang, rang, rang until I answered. And when I did answer, my throat was super dry. And I said, let me get some water. When I went in, I realized he turned all the taps of the cooker on and the house was full of gas. So he would have done that. We had passed out. And you can die from carbon monoxide yes. and poisoning. And anything could have triggered that spark. Yeah. So the whole house would have exploded. And he knew this. And my son eventually spoke up at school and said, what's happening? He was really brave. They took him very seriously. Um, and we were removed. I wasn't allowed to take anything with me. I had 20 minutes. And when you've got 20 minutes, you panic. You're like, you're looking at your house. This is your home. This is my children's home where I brought up. I built this home, literally. Yeah. I built the extension myself with nail guns and everything. I was there. And I'm leaving it all behind. And I don't know what's going to happen. I've got nothing. I've got no parents, nobody to support me. But I'm being brave again. And I'm taking his hand. I've got my long coat on. He's got his shorts on and a really bright color t-shirt, a Barcelona t-shirt. And we enter this safe home with nothing. You know, I had probably a tissue that was probably less than this. And as I opened the door, I knew things were not going to be good when I stepped on that carpet and there was this squelchy noise because the carpet was just sodden. It was just full of human urine. Um, and the walls were smeared with the human feces and... I thought, what have I done? Where have I brought him? And he was so exhausted. I cleaned up the bed with my tissue, took my coat off, wrapped him up because it was so cold. There was no heating, no bedding, nothing. It was almost like going back to my childhood, you know, with the bare walls. And I really felt that. Mm. And I sat him, lay him down. He fell asleep really quickly. He said he felt like Later on, you know, when we spoke about it, he said that night felt like a bad dream. And that's exactly how it felt to me. And I sat in the other room and for the first time in my life, I really cried, really cried from within for my childhood, for the rape, for the child marriage, for being sold to somebody, for being constantly bitten and sexually abused, for being set on fire almost, for taking domestic violence you know for some of the things he did to me and the way he treated me taking it all and it wasn't a pity party it was almost like a release and a realization that god you've been through so much and I remember looking down I had this puddle of tears almost and I said to myself again talking Nina are you going to drown in those tears are you going to dance in them and I said I've got him in the other room I've got my other children and it's always a reasoning with myself you know I've got to have reason with myself that I can't give up I just couldn't and I actually jumped up um, and we were on an estate I'd never been anywhere like this in my life and I started to dance and I started to dance there were boys on bikes outside probably watching me I didn't care I didn't have any music I was just dancing and weirdly I felt quite free but I also knew that 
I was going to change everyone's lives again. I would do it because I had to do it. And um, after a little while, we got thrown out because they don't give you a safe home if you've got money. And it had come to light that I can't have benefits because on paper, I'm a millionaire. A lot of those businesses folded, by the way, because he didn't run them and I couldn't run them. Um, we ended up having to move to, well, nearly 400 miles away because the police couldn't protect me. Their motto is to protect and serve. I had gone to probably six or seven different police stations, but none of them could ever help me. Sometimes he was following me and he was there and they saw him in their cameras, but he didn't punch you in the face, did he? Was their reply. You know, so the non-molestation orders didn't really help us. And when I moved, I stopped looking over my shoulder. I stopped walking on eggshells. I stopped looking for community members. I actually realized what it's like to live. I started nursing my son because he was suffering from mental health. Um, and how, how old was you now? I turned 50. Okay. I turned 50 and my son had tried to, he'd run away to try and kill himself. That's another story. Um, but he'd come back and he was a very angry child. So I was nursing his depression. I decided not to give him pharmaceuticals. I decided love was the only answer that I would give him boundaries and I would love him and I would give him space and I would listen when he spoke to me. I would actually listen to what he was really trying to tell me. Mm. I was patient, but the time that I really changed and that penny dropped was when I was standing in the garden, no shoes on, I'm, I'm a, I ground. You know, I'm one of, I'm, I believe Mother Nature is my mother, that she nurtures me. And I was doing my affirmations, so I'd watched all these videos and I was putting them into practice. But you can say all your affirmations as much as you like unless you believe them, they don't work. And I used to want to be tall because you know, everybody was tall in my family, I'm sure. So I was started off with that and I was started saying I'm tall and I'm beautiful. And I decided that everything everyone had told me was a lie. It was their version, their truth, not mine. Yeah. That I wasn't fat and ugly. I was actually beautiful. That I was Rapunzel, because I loved the story of Rapunzel letting down her long hair. <clears throat> and I decided that life would be as I wanted it. And I wanted it to be full of internal peace and love. And when you develop this self-love for yourself, it's very enlightening. It's almost like a, a warmth inside you. It's hard to explain. And I didn't care so much about the exterior because they had kept me, weirdly, really pure you know, on the inside. I didn't lie, I didn't cheat, I didn't hurt, I didn't steal, I didn't harm anybody. If anything, I had given unconditional love to my parents. I'd unconditionally loved my brothers. I'd unconditionally loved my children's father. Everybody. I had never wished them any harm, even when I should have. So I realized I was this person that was quite good. And that's what all the biblical texts teach you to stay this good person. And I felt I had almost seen them as cheat codes. And I was playing this game to get to the top. And I was already nearly there because I had swerved all the distractions of dating apps. I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in faked filters and stuff because, not because I didn't care about how I looked, but because I loved me so much from within. I knew the outside would be fine because I loved it. And it didn't matter what you thought or he thought or she thought. I love me. So even though your opinion may be taken slightly, it's never going to change who I am or what I am. And I knew that I had this gift that I didn't have a degree. You know, I thought I was stupid because I was called stupid by my ex-partner. But I realized I was very exceptionally clever because I had people skills. I could help a girl that had been abused. I could help a woman that had been beaten by her partner or somebody that's been subjected to a certain type of abuse from our culture, gender-based violence, gender-based discrimination. You can't learn these things. You can't read them in textbooks. You have to feel them. You have to walk in that path. And I realized that I was this person that made a lot of sense because I say things as they are because I didn't know how to lie, right? Yeah. And that was good. It was refreshing for people to come to me. And people say, how do you meet famous people? And I don't know. I could be at a train station. I met my first client who um, is the heavyweight champion of the world. He's just left the UFC, let's say his name. But he met me um, and I spoke to his group of people from 7 p.m. till 11 a.m. the next morning. And my daughter's wondering where the hell I am. Yeah. But we are sat literally around just chatting. And I'm not chatting, I'm listening. I'm actually listening to them and I'm allowing them to express how they feel. And I'm telling them that I see them. I really sense your pain 
and I'm giving them encouragement and saying from almost a maternal point of view that, you know what, you've got this. You might feel alone when you're in that cage or that ring, but you've done all the work and that journey has been your journey, not anyone else's. You, you've got this. So I became this coach because I believed that your mind is the most powerfulest of weapons that you could ever have in your in your system, in your mindset, yeah. So how long have you been a coach now, Nina? Um, I started coaching three, practically three years ago, and it was an incident that just happened. I accidentally met these people, but then more came and more came forward. And I've put my coaching to one side, I'm, I'm going to be honest, because the video that went viral taught me that there are so many people suffering and I really, really feel their pain here because I've been there. And these are lives. These are real lives. So I do rely on people donating or I will do talks for free. But I will say to them, donate to my nonprofit. So I speak around around the world. I'm speaking in Cyprus this the next week, this week. <laughs> I'll be there speaking about arranged marriages and things because obviously they have a similar culture yeah. and self-love. But that money will go straight to my nonprofit because... I don't know how long I'm here for, but I want to definitely leave my imprint on people's lives through love, through their hearts. Mm -hmm. You're a real example of what um, a life coach should really be. Someone with a, a wealth of experience and been through so much like you have and how you've uh, dealt with adversities, you know. There's so many people out there um, this means by like I, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but there's like a a twenty four year old who may, might have been through one problem and now he's a life coach. Yeah, everybody's a life coach. You I know? say it all the time. <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't get it. It's like, a bit you, worrying because you know, you're playing with people's lives, and often you can do more damage than good. So, you know, I respect everyone that comes to me, and I don't work with everyone that comes to me. If I know I can't work with them because we're not in alignment, I will will tell them that. Yeah, so I've just got a couple of, before we uh, wrap up, Nina, thank you so much for sharing all of that. I've just got a few little questions that I'm going to fire out um, to yourself and then maybe you can just, within a minute or two, you can just yeah. summarise it. Um, some of these I've already asked, uh, asked you already, but let's see if we can grab any from here. Um, so what's been your proudest accomplishment so far? My children. <laughs> lovely short and sweet um how do you approach a problem so when a problem comes to you what's the first thing what's your thought process i don't see it as a problem um i don't overthink it either normally we know the solution straight away but then we start to question ourselves and self-sabotage so if you come to me with a problem i always have a really calm attitude like your father i guess mm -hmm. um i believe when you're calm you see things so much clearer um, and I just find, I break things down. So I break them down to doable things to end up with a result. Yes, yes, lovely. How do you deal with failure and setbacks? Failures are good. People don't see that. But if you look at my life, it's been almost 50 years of failing. Um, but the where I am now, I wouldn't change one of those failures or one of those downturns or those traumas because they've taught me so much. And people say to me, you know, I'm, I'm 50, I can't do anything now. And I say, well, you've got 50 years of experience of what not to do. You've got that wealth of knowledge without realising it. So what can you do with what you've got? How can you change things? What small thing can you do that will make it right this time? Or try something new. It doesn't always have to be the mm -hmm. same thing. Definitely. Um, how do you collaborate and work with others? So how do you not just like say, it's just me, myself and I, because together, sometimes you can do more things. Like, are you doing any things right now? Yeah, most definitely. Like I said to you earlier, um, before we started recording, I said that if I shout at the top of my voice, I might get to a few people. But if we stand together, yes. we're so much louder. And I believe working with other people helps not just them, but it helps you too. And I'm very much about building others up. I don't want to be at the top of the ladder looking down. I want mm -hmm. to take people with me. You can't expect everyone to not break the rung that you stood upon that step you're on because they will do that. But you have to accept that you've done the right thing and just keep going and always want to, you know, to be that person that can help someone else. And uh, finally, um, what are your goals for the future, both personally and professionally? I'm living each day as it comes. I get a lot of death threats, as you know. I take security with me everywhere. Um, 
I am creating ripples of change. I wrote down on my um, whiteboard, I think three years ago, that I would affect 33 million people and <coughs> create 33 ripples of change and that wealth would come back to me. Um, and I've gone past that 33. Yeah, you know, you I, reached that on one reel. Yeah, so I'm um, really quite... Um, I'm focused on the here and now, um, helping people because I know that I can make a change not just for them but their children and the futures coming forward. So I'm just going to keep doing me. The future for me, hopefully, will be I get to rest a little bit more because I'm overworked at the moment. But that's something I'm taking on board because I know that sometimes it's a lot of pressure because you think you can, the only person that can do it. Unfortunately, in my line of work, people only trust me. So I've got to build a network. So when I've helped these women or men, whoever it is, later on, they will become me. So I'll have an army of love going forward to help other people change. Nice, nice, amazing. Finally, do you have any questions for me? If yeah, one question I do actually. Um, you know that you've lived quite a loving life. Um, I know that you have a sister also, so I'm not going to bring them into it all. Her, uh, if there's more than one. But if you can understand how I was treated just because I was born a girl, how does that actually make you feel, you know, do you feel super privileged for being a boy or? I don't feel super privileged. It's sad hearing your story. Um, in my world, it doesn't sound normal, you know, and with my, my peers and even in the higher networks I'm at, we see how, what, who's doing what with their daughters and the karate lessons they're taking them, the self-discipline, the tutoring, the tutor teachers that we have around to help the kids, etc. You know, I, I see there's no difference as a, a man and a woman in my world, in my circle. And if that isn't normal, then, yeah, maybe I should also be doing something like you and, 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 and setting an example and saying this is what we should be doing if it's not happening. Because, um, you know, before your story, it just really hit me like a car crash. Let me rephrase it. Okay. Do you think your life would have been different had you been born a girl? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think it would have um, because we do come from a different generation. Not quite the same, um, you know, uh, I'm not cut from the same cloth, but yes, it would have been different. You know, do my sisters work and look after themselves? Yes. Are they happy? Yeah, most of them are. But, you know, the opportunities, like I went off to go uni and start businesses and entrepreneurs, whereas they were to start families and stuff. Do you know what I mean? So it would have been different, yeah. Thank you for being honest. Yeah. Yes. True. But going forward, next generation is not going to be that way. And it's this is the thing that we have to realise is, are you going to be changed? Are you going to change things? Like, what is the difference between a boy and girl? There isn't any sort Well, everyone listening can either be part of the problem or the solution. So if someone's listening and they think, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. They can raise awareness. They can keep an eye out if they're a teacher. They can start looking out for that little girl that maybe needs that attention, that love, that bit of kindness, that stroking of the hair, that interaction. Um, if they're working in the police force, they can actually start learning more about honour killings. I've, I'm one person trying to spread this message, but yeah. I always say to people, honour my story. If you're not going to honour anything else, honour my story that I'm literally cutting myself opening, open and, you know, bearing my all to everybody for a reason, not because I enjoy it, because I don't. I do it so that I can create change to evoke thought for other people to come forward. And if there's somebody out there struggling that feels almost like they can't ask for help, you know, I'm going to ask them just to have a little bit of courage to ask for help. There's not just myself. There are a few organisations that I believe in. I can put you in touch with them. There's a lot of organisations that are there just for the money and the I'm running a non-profit, which I don't like. But, you know, there are some heart-centred people and the more people come forward, the more survivors there will be, the more change we can create. Yes. Nina, if you just look straight into that camera, if you just tell everybody how they can follow you or if they need some help, how they can sort of reach you. Sure. Okay. <coughs> so I'm known as London's Life Coach. You can find me on social media um, on Instagram, London's Life Coach. Um, if you just Google my name, Nina Alk, uh, you'll come across my website. Please send me a message. There's also my nonprofit, which is called endhonorkillings.org. You can send us a message, which will be um, coming straight to me. You will have complete confidentiality. 
and I will guide you however best I can to help you get out of the situation. Please, please remember that you deserve this, that you are worthy, and most of all, that you are loved by at least me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Guys, what an inspirational podcast this was today. We are absolutely um, honoured in the presence of Nina. Um, so please go on over to her page, go and show her some love and spread the message, you know, because there's always people in need and people, you know, people who need help. And I hope this has been inspiring for you. You know, this is why we bring people onto the podcast so you get all of this information. And without you guys, we don't have a podcast. So don't forget to like, share, add a comment, guys, you know, show your friends and families and um, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you again.